2021 is here. Holy shit. I thought 2020 would never end. I'm so glad that year is over. Let me get myself set up right there. That's what we want. <clears throat> yeah, man. I hope that 2021 <clears throat> yeah, is man, not I a hope replay that of 2020. That would suck. That would suck a lot. So I'm hoping 2021 is a much better freaking year. Let me get myself set up over here, guys. Hope that you had a great, great New Year's. Uh, right there in the chat, first message says, yo, yo, Mark sent me here. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, thank you, Mark, for the shout out. Unrivaled Boxing He's one of the best. I love listening to Mark. So uh, I'm sure that he's going to be on at some point today. I know he wants to talk about Mr. Ayoka over from Japan. And we'll be talking about him a lot. Let me get myself set up here. We're going to go live on Spreaker. So those of you listening to the audio version can hear me live. And then uh, we'll get the show going. Phone lines open today, guys. Anything goes. This is the first show of 2021. Let me make sure that my levels are good. If uh, I'm not too quiet, hopefully I'm not too loud or just right on the volume. If there's any issues, let me know. As far as the numbers go, I see uh, a couple of you guys in the chat asking. Right behind me, you see on top there, that is the toll-free number in the United States. Right below that, toll-free in the U.K., so if you're in the USA or UK, you could call in toll-free. All right, let me go live over on Spreaker, guys. We'll get the show started. Hello again, fight fans. Welcome to 2021. Thought we would not make it out of 2020, but here we are. And this is episode number 250 of the Neutral Corner Boxing Podcast. I am your host, Michael Montero for Ring Magazine, ringtv.com, and the Ring Digital YouTube channel. Today we're going to talk about Kazuto Yoka stopping Kosei Tanaka in Tokyo, Japan last week to close out 2020. And of course, Ryan Garcia stopping Luke Campbell. Both Ioka and Garcia win in uh, impressive fashion. Ioka closes out 2020. Garcia brings in 2021 in style. And we're going to take a look at the Fab Five, as I call them. And maybe I should be called Six. We'll talk about that. But um, a group of young, undefeated American fighters currently campaigning in or around the lightweight division. And that was part of, well, I should say the subject of my uh, latest piece in Ring Magazine. Check it out. Here we go. Uh, it's titled In With The New. And of course, this is in the February 2021 issue. If you don't have it already, you need to check it out. That's with the fighter of the year, in my opinion, Tiafimo Lopez on the cover. Also in that issue, uh, I had another piece in there. I spoke with George Cambosos Jr. over in Australia, and I talked to him uh, about our lightweight ratings and asked him <clears throat> his opinions on Ring's lightweight ratings, and he gave uh, really, really truthful accounts, and, and honest, brutally honest, and he didn't really pull any punches. Um, good stuff from George. I want to have him on the show, so we will do that definitely uh, early in 2021. So, all right, guys, um, some housekeeping stuff. Uh, for those of you who... Uh, did not catch last week's episode. We are completely ad-free on the Ring Digital's YouTube channel. So if you are watching the Neutral Corner live here on the Ring Digital right now, uh, we are ad-free, whether you watch live or you catch the show later on the Ring Digital YouTube channel. So make sure that you're subscribed to the channel. Make sure that you click the notifications button. Do not miss an episode of TNC Live. And again, man, ad free here on the Ring Digital platform. On my platforms where you catch the audio, or you catch the replay, uh, you're still going to get ads. But ad free on Ring, I don't know any other podcast on a platform as reputable as the Ring that's doing that and giving you guys a voice with the phone calls. Once again, toll free in the United States, 213 267 7787. And toll free in the UK as well, 02081 You can find the audio version of the podcast on my platforms, Montero on Boxing, anywhere podcasts are found, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, et cetera, et cetera. Go out there, search for me, find me, and check out the show. As always, I ask you guys to give thumbs up, likes, 
ratings, reviews, and uh, tweet it out. Post it in your, your boxing blogs, on your social media. That's what helps me the most is getting the word out about the show. This is episode number 250, 250. We are one quarter of a way of the way to a thousand shows, which we will hit one day. Uh, but you know, every time we kind of hit a new landmark with the number of shows, I just think to myself, where are we going to be when we hit 300, 400, 500? You know, so now that we're at 250, the next big landmark I, I think will be 250. Or I'm sorry, 500. And I've been you know wondering, man, where will the show be? Where will I be? Where will boxing be? Whenever we hit episode number 500 of the show, that's going to be crazy. But to be at episode number 250 and to think about where the show started, where I was just literally talking on my couch for 10 minutes, uh, answering questions, and that was pretty much it. You know, ask, ask, asking questions or answering questions uh, about fights th the weekend before, or giving a quick, you know, just overview. And those shows were like 10, 15 minutes. They were terrible. <laughs> and then we went to, you know, uh, an hour long show, and there was, Brief, briefly a, a period where we divided it up between two shows a week where we did a, a review show, a preview show. We've been all over, but the show has continued to grow. And um, we're kicking ass, taking names. We got some things on the way, some changes coming in 2021. I should state that we probably won't have a show for the next two or three weeks because there's not a whole lot going on this month. There's not a lot of fights on the schedule. The next big fight it's going to be a while before we have the, the first big fight of the year. The first notable fights, as far as who's fighting, you know, Artur Baturbiev, Caleb Plant, a few guys like that, they're not fighting till the end of this month. So we probably won't have a show for a couple of weeks. But today, uh, let's see, I want to, so yeah, I'm looking at here in my notes. It might be Monday, January 25, before we have the next episode of The Neutral Corner. Now, over on my YouTube channel, Montero Unboxing, which you need to subscribe to, I'll probably do some live chats and do some news and notes, those sorts of things, uh, those videos on my channel. But as far as the podcast itself, just not a whole lot to review, preview until the end of this month, okay? So it could be two or three weeks before we do the show again. Uh, let's let's jump right into this, man. I wanted to, uh, there's not a whole lot going on with news and notes for right at the beginning of the year. But I wanted to talk about what I call the Fab Five. And again, this was uh, the subject of my latest article in Ring Mag. And I understand not all of these guys right here uh, are, are in the lightweight division currently, but let's give the names, okay? Tiafimo Lopez, of course, the lightweight champion of the world right now. Uh, Gervonta Davis, he's currently campaigning at junior lightweight, 130 pounds, but he'll be, he's had one fight technically at lightweight, and he won a piece of a title there. And he'll be back at 135 pounds full-time, probably by the end of this year, if you want to think about it. And then, of course, Ryan Garcia, who just won an interim title at 135. He's definitely a player now by beating Luke Campbell last week. Devin Haney, one of the top prospects in boxing. You want to call him a contender? Fine. I understand he has a title. It's as thin as this paper. My notes are on. We'll talk about that in a second. But he's still... Uh, someone to keep an eye on, obviously, uh, one of the top young guns in the sport. And then Shakur Stevenson, who, I get it, started at 126, currently campaigning at 130, but he will be at 135 very, very soon. And then there's this guy that everyone tends to forget, including myself, and that is Chris Colbert, who, yes, campaigning at 130, I, I think he'll be the last of all the fighters I just mentioned to move up to 135, but he'll eventually be at 135. But he's kind of flying under the radar. Uh, won the New York City Golden Gloves, I think, back in 2014. Qualified for the 2016 Olympics and basically told the Olympic F itself, which I love because his position was, man, there was way too much, too much politics in the Olympics and everything else. I want to go pro and start making money. Personally, I love that attitude, and I don't blame him one bit. If you're a young American kid and you've got the skills to go pro and you can start making money, why not? So that was what he did, and he uh, he had a good 2020, and I expect even bigger things from him in 2021. So maybe instead of the Fab Five, maybe we should call them the, the Sensational Six. But there are six young, undefeated American fighters right now, either campaigning at 130 or 135 currently, and they are going to be in the mix with each other, really for this entire generation. And they need to fight each other to figure out the pecking order. There's talk the WBC has mandated a fight. If they haven't yet, they will soon. 
uh, between Devin Haney and Ryan Garcia because once Garcia beat Luke Campbell, and we'll talk about that fight here in a few minutes, uh, but once he beat Luke Campbell, he became technically the mandatory for Devin Haney's paper-thin bullshit title. And that brings me to, so I, well, real quick, if those two fight this year, that's awesome. But we need to see all these guys fight each other. And yes, by the end of the year, Tiafima Lopez will be at 140 pounds. But all these guys are going to move up. They're all going to be fighting between 135 to 147 over the next four or five years. And we need to see them all fight. Anyway. I want to talk to you guys about the difference between a prospect, a contender, a title holder, a champion. These are four distinctly different levels in the pecking order of professional boxing. And because of the PR machine right now, whether it's the promoters, the PR people that work for the promoters, you see these guys on social media posting stuff all the time. Uh, the networks, which are essentially promoters themselves, and then the social media spin from the fighters themselves and the commentators, all of it. I think a lot of younger fans, newer fans to the sport, and then ca what I call casual observers of the sport, whether young, old, or in between, uh, get confused with all these terms. It, it, we live in an era of the prospect champion. We see that a lot. There's guys that are 21, 22 years old, that are not ready to compete with the elite level fighters in the sport, yet they've got titles. They've got world titles. And we see this all the time. There's dozens of examples I could bring up uh, just in recent years with this, right? And now with the uh, WBC, it used to be only the WBA, but the WBC has joined on. There are several divisions now where the, the sanctioning body has three champions just in one division. You've got 17 divisions, well, I think 18 now, because the WBC just created Bridgerweight, and the other sanctioning organizations, don't shoot the messenger here, are going to join on in the next three to five years and add Bridgerweight. Bridgerweight's here to stay, guys. Trust me, okay? Sad but true. So 18 divisions, and if you are a sanctioning body that has three champions, quote-unquote, in each division, start doing the math there. What is that, 54 champions? Off the top of my head, my math isn't great, but... That's scary. And then you've got four sanctioning bodies. So, so five years from now, guys, there are going to be over 200 world champions in the sport of boxing at any given time. So that's a crazy, scary place, but that's where we're heading. And that's just with the four major groups. Then there's the secondary sanctioning organizations out there as well. So how do you make sense of all this shit? Okay, real quick, let me just try to, let's look at the lightweight division, okay? 135 pounds right now. Try to make sense of this. If you were going to explain this to a young kid or maybe to your wife or to, to your grandfather or some, somebody you're trying to get into boxing, okay, just in a lightweight division. This is one of the original divisions in boxing going all the way back. This isn't one of the junior or super divisions or bridge or weight, you know, something that just came about recently or in the last few decades. Lightweight is one of the original Weight class is going all the way back to the beginning. And this sport goes back centuries. So classic storied division. Some of the greatest fighters ever pound for pound campaign in this division. Currently right now we have five guys with titles. Five guys that call themselves champions on social media. Their promoters, their advisors, their management, the networks they fight on. All call them champions. Five guys that hold titles. Meanwhile, there's only one motherfucking champion in this division, and his name is Tiafimo Lopez. But, uh, well, let me break down Tio's titles, okay? Tiafimo Lopez right now has the ring title, WBO, IBF, the WBA Super, and the WBC Franchise. So every sanctioning organization has a piece of Tio. And holding the ring title, the only title, in my opinion, that really freaking matters, he is the lineal champion. He is the man who beat the man, okay? He beat Vasily Lomachenko, who beat Jorge Linares, cleaned out the division, unified the titles. He was the man. Tio beat him. He's the man. But also, Gervonta Tang Davis. Remember when I said he's campaigning at 130 pounds? That's true. His last fight against Leo Santa Cruz was at 130, and that was a, technically a title fight. The WBA 
currently recognizes Javante Tank Davis as their regular, I got, I got to make sure I got this right, their regular lightweight champion and their super junior lightweight champion, okay? Try to make sense of this shit. <laughs> Tank Davis is the WBA regular 135 champ and the WBA super 130 champ. Who did he beat to get that regular title at 135? That was last last year. I was about to say last year, but we're in 2021. It was the end of 2019. Here in Atlanta, he fought Yoriokas Gamboa, a really a blown-up featherweight, fighting on one foot because his Achilles heel had a tear in it. And uh, remember, Tank missed weight for that fight, finally made weight after a couple of attempts, uh, struggled at times, but dropped Gamboa multiple times. Okay, beat him. Was that worthy of any world title at 135? Was, did anybody think Yoriokas Gamboa was a top 10 lightweight when Gervonta Davis fought him? Well, he got a piece of a title at 135, goes down in his next fight, fights at 130 against Leo Santa Cruz, a blown up junior featherweight who had no business fighting at 130. And you saw that when he got knocked the hell out. Uh, but the WBA is cool with keeping Gervonta at 135 and 130 at the same time. So this dude has a piece of their 8,000 titles between 130 and 135. I continue. Rolando Romero has the WBA interim lightweight title. Now, he won back, uh, I think, August 15, 2020, last year. That was the robbery of 2020. He did not win that fight. But he got the decision. The House judges scored it for the House fighter because the House promoter slipped him some ducats. You know how this thing works. Rolando Romero wins the robbery of the year last year. It's right up there with the other you know, three or four shit robberies that we saw last year. And has the WBA interim title. So the WBA recognizes Tiafima Lopez as their super champ. Gervonta Davis, who doesn't even fight at lightweight right now, as their regular champ. Rolando Romero, who lost his last fight soundly and won via robbery as their interim champ. Then there's the WBC, who rates Tio as their super champion. And Devin Haney as their regular champion. Devin Haney, mind you, won the interim title. Back in 2019, I think, by beating Zaur Abdelayev. Remember that? And then was awarded the regular title via email when they bumped up Vasily Lomachenko to franchise. Even though Devin Haney, when he became interim champ, it, think of interim as basically, you're basically the mandatory for the champion. Well, Haney had won that belt, that interim belt. I think it was a vacant interim belt. And it would only have been a two, three weeks and the, the WBC elevated Lomachenko to franchise, even though he had an entire year to me. They hadn't even mandated the mandatory match yet, but technically you're supposed to have a year to fight your mandatory. Anyway, he was interim. They bump him to regular. And now Ryan Garcia is the WBC interim champion for beating Luke Campbell last week, even though Luke Campbell hadn't fought in over a year. It was coming off a loss to Vasily Lomachenko. Try to make sense of that mess. OK, when I tell you guys that there is a difference between a title holder and a champion, this is what I'm talking about. All the bullshit I just said over the last five minutes don't mean dick. Those guys are title holders. The first sentence I said before all that, when I said Tia Fiba Lopez is the lightweight champion of the world, the man who beat the man, that's all that matters. He's the champ. Everyone else is just a title holder. Now, I tweeted this. I think you know, yesterday or Saturday, over the weekend. And I got attacked by some of the Haney fans or some of the, the King Rive fans or some of the Tank Davis fans saying, no, 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 Tio ain't the champ. He got to go through Tank. He got to go through uh, Haney. Guys, they're just holding paper titles. The champion is Tiafima Lopez. Some of you guys need to do just 10 minutes of damn research, just 10 minutes. If you go to a fighter's profile on BoxRec, they've made it idiot-proof there. They've made it so easy for you. If you go to a fighter's profile and you look at the, uh, the match where they won their title, you put your mouse over the title and you'll see it highlights. You can click it and you can see the history of that title. And they, they've done this for the regular title, the interim title, the super title, all of it. It may not give you the nuance of... Uh, maybe a, a fighter moving up in weight, and that's how it became vacant. It may not give you those details, but you can see 
who had the title, the lineage of it, if you will. It's very interesting. So, so for you younger fans of the sport, you newer fans of the sport, you casual observers to the sport, I'm glad you're all here. We need you guys. You guys are the next generation of fans. But do 10 minutes of research before you clap back at me on social media. Just click on the fighter's profile and click on their title and see how they got that title. See who's held it before. Are we talking, when you look at the lineage, is it a bunch of Hall of Famers? Is it a bunch of all-time greats? Or is it just a, a bunch of dudes? Is it just a bunch of guys? And be honest with yourself. So I say all this because we live in an era where a guy like Adrian Broner, yeah, I'm going to beat up on the AB a little bit right here. And, and I got nothing against AB. I, I'm just saying he could call himself a four-division world champion. And technically speaking, in this era of boxing, you can say that. But the reality is he held world titles in four divisions. He was never the champion of any one division. At no point in Adrian Broner's career was he seen as the top dog in any division he campaigned in. Never. He won vacant titles. He won paper-thin titles off of dudes that had no business being in a title fight. He got, uh, you know, very, very, uh, what, what's the word to use? Uh, I'm trying to think of a better word than gift. But he got Christmas present scoring from certain judges in certain fights. Remember the Ponce de Leon fight? I was ringside for that one and others. A lot of people felt he lost to Balanyaji. Anyway. Adrian Broner's titles are paper thin, and if you do 10 minutes of research, you will see that. The fact that he's on the same list as some all-time great fighters that won titles in four different weight classes 50 years ago, that's laughable. It's the same thing with Leo Santa Cruz. Leo Santa Cruz won titles technically in four different weights. Most of who he fought was very limited. A lot of the titles, again, either vacant or pieces of titles broken up, busted up uh, because of the sanctioning body craziness. And this isn't to beat up on Leo Santa Cruz. Good fighter. Adrian Broner, good fighter. Just not great fighters. So when you see these guys and they have titles in four divisions, five divisions, or even let's take somebody like Robert Guerrero. Robert Guerrero, I don't even think, won a real full regular title. He won like interim titles, vacant, you know, stuff like that. And he goes around calling himself a multi-division champion. He wasn't even a regular title holder. He won like interim titles. And Robert's a great guy. He's a super, super nice guy. He's done some wonderful charity work in his community and stuff. I'm not trying to knock him. I'm not trying to knock any of these guys. I'm just letting you guys know that's the difference, okay? None of those guys that I just mentioned, not one of them, have done what Tiafima Lopez did this year when he beat Vasily Lomachenko. He is the man at lightweight, the champ, the only champ. Everyone else is just a title holder. That's the difference. Go back several years when Vladimir Klitschko owned the heavyweight division for a decade. He's, he's a guy I go to a lot when I try to give this example because it's an easy dynamic to see. For 10 years, that dude ran the heavyweight division. And then briefly, while he was the champion, the lineal champion, Deontay Wilder won a title off of beating Berman Stavern, who beat Chris Ariola. All right? That title was basically sold from the Suleimans to Don King to Al Hamer. They wanted no business getting Vladimir Klitschko in the ring to, to get in that, that WBC title once Vitaly retired, right? They were trying to buy in to the PB, eventually what would become the PBC business. It was a business move for them. So uh, everyone knew Deontay Wilder held a title. But he wasn't the champ. That was Vladimir Klitschko. And there's a million of these examples I could give, okay? So that is the difference, guys. When I say champion versus title holder versus now prospect and contender, if you're, I don't give a shit. Some of you guys will look at the fighters like Guillermo Rigondeaux, Vasily Lomachenko, uh, some of these uh, other guys that come from the Cuban system, uh, the old Soviet system, and they're coming over now and they're, they're, They've only got, you know, uh, three, four years as fighters and they're fighting for titles. Some of these guys are fighting for titles in their second or third year as pros. And you'll look at the number of fights they have. This is something a lot of the Lomachenko haters would point out. Oh, he's only got 14, 15 fights. How can this dude be pound for pound? It's not about the number of fights. It's who you're fighting. Meanwhile, there are guys that have been pros for five, six, seven years, and they ain't fought nobody. 
and their record's 25 and 0. I don't give a shit. You ain't, you're still a prospect. You ain't fought nobody. You have to fight a legitimate, bona fide, proven top 10 fighter in your division and beat them before you could call yourself a contender. And that's what Ryan Garcia did against Luke Campbell last week. Ryan Garcia, last Saturday in Dallas, Texas, graduated from prospect to contender. I don't give a shit what the WBC says. Oh, he's an interim world champion. Nah, dude. He's a contender. His next, next uh, level up the ladder will be to prove himself as a title holder. But he is in no damn way a champion. All right? So, guys, it, all of them do it. Every single promoter, every single manager, advisor, trainer, every single network executive, uh, network commentator, even the, the ones I love, and a lot of people in the damn media who are tied to a particular uh, vehicle with the platform they write for, do this. A lot of them, just about all of them do it, okay? So it's not one side doing it more than the other. I'm not going to say that this is a, a biased thing. It's just the sport of boxing as we know it. Keep in mind, you're constantly being manipulated in everything that you read. If it's coming from a promoter, a network, and even the fighter themselves, a lot of the time, it's propaganda. And you're going to have to read between uh, the, the, the black and white. You're going to have to get the fine print, the gray area, and do a little bit of research. The thing is now, it's not like guys that were following this sport in the 80s where you had to go to the library and read books. and shit. You guys could go on the damn internet. You could go on BoxRec. You could go on Wiki. And you could spend 10 minutes and just do a little research and figure out the truth, okay? The onus is on you to sift through the bullshit. And that's why a lot of you guys watch and listen to this show, because that's what I try to do here. That's why so many of the promoters hate my freaking guts and the sanctioning organizations and uh, even the damn state athletic commissions don't like me very well because I just tell the damn truth. Anyway, uh, we have a super chat pledge from J&M. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. He says, howdy, Mike. J&M here, a.k.a. Harrison Property. Oh, man. All right. Changing the name again. I think that's your third name change. Anyway, thank you for the super chat. He says, belated Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. As always, keep up the terrific work. I sincerely, sincerely appreciate that. Okay, guys, let's do a quick fight review. Reminder that if you want to get on the phones in the United States, it is toll-free 213-267-7787. In the UK, 02081-036051. All right, so let's go back to last Thursday, which technically was last year. Last Thursday, the last fight card of 2020 in Tokyo, Japan. Kazuto Ioka scores a TKO 8 win over Kosei Tanaka, defending his super flyweight title. And in my opinion, making a clear push for the pound-for-pound -pound list. Now, I saw some videos circling on uh, Twitter, uh, certain YouTube channels, and, and to quote one dude, he said, uh, well, you know what, I'm, I'm loosely quoting him. I don't remember it word for word, but he basically said something. That, that fight over in Japan, I ain't watched that shit. So there are some people, some YouTube channels with agendas that maybe didn't watch that, and it's a shame that it wasn't picked up by The Zone or ESPN Plus, somebody, even in the YouTube channel, to, to show over here. Real damn shame. But there were streams out there. I know I watched it live. A bunch of you guys did. Or you caught a replay on YouTube or something. So for uh, for Tanaka, let's talk about him real quick. Uh, this was his first loss as a pro. I noticed that uh, he, he made a lot of mistakes. First of all, he came out way too aggressive. I think he was trying to make a statement early on, which I understand. But he needed to pull back after the first couple rounds. He kept being a little too aggressive three, four, five rounds in. Uh, it really shot his wad. He was Everything was one speed. Everything was a fastball. There was a little bit of Oscar Valdez in Kosei Tanaka in that respect, where everything was one speed. There was no variation. And by the time he was trying to make adjustments, it was too late. Ioka had kind of figured him out. For, uh, for And another thing, too, Tanaka moved in straight lines, straight in, straight out. Head up, straight in, straight out. Not a lot of angles. Um, the spacing wasn't there. The spacing was pretty good early on, but uh, once Yoka made adjustments, 
And it really, you know, he just had superior craft. But once he kind of cut the distance and saw some things in Tanaka, and I, I posted a video on my YouTube channel where I really break down the science and craft of that fight. Uh, it should be the last video on my YouTube channel. So go check it out if you haven't seen it yet. But I talked about some subtle little things that I saw, uh, mistakes Tanaka was making that maybe the untrained eye couldn't see early on, but the trained eye could see like, ooh, ooh this ain't going to end well for him. And uh, really, really good, just wonderful boxing science and craft from Ioka, particularly in the middle rounds where he chopped down Tanaka, dropped him a few times, scores the knockout. Um, kept his cool early on when Tanaka was really, really uh, using aggression, you know, and, f and pushing him back a little bit. But ultimately, he used his aggression against him. And that's what you want to see from a pound for pound type of performer. Uh, CompuBox, I know you guys hate punch stats. Let me just briefly, briefly say CompuBox gave credit to Ioka for 174 landed punches, 35% accuracy. Tanaka only landed 89%, 17% percent accuracy so they threw about the same amount of punches but Ioka much more uh, just consistent throughout and uh, different speed different angles at times when he needed it backed up when he needed to came forward when he needed to turned Tanaka when he needed to and ultimately used his aggression against him much more accurate with his punching okay um, let's jump to the phones here guys we have a phone call and uh, then we'll get back to the review. There's no preview this week because there's nothing uh, going on. There's no fights on the schedule. So uh, call in any time if you want to chat. For now, we'll jump over to the phones. And we've got uh, 353 on the line. You're on the show. Go. How's it going, Michael? This is Mark from Ireland. How are you, sir? Good. Mark, I thought that might be you. I know you got a lot to get off your <laughs> chest, man. So, so go ahead and just spit your game, man, whatever you got to say. Well, first of all, when it comes to Tanaka and Yoko, I think what we saw there was the difference between a world-class prospective talent overall and a pound-for-pound -pound caliber talent. I think that's something that we saw defensively and offensively. We also saw a huge experience gap in terms of the corner mm -hmm. because, as we all know, Yoko is with um, Ishmael Salas, who last year arguably put himself into the fray for trainer of the year versus Derek James with the wins of Ugas getting a regular title, Joe Joyce being an underdog and stopping Dubois, and Ioka being a betting underdog, and also getting a victory. Two knockout upsets, according to the bet makers. So hmm. there's a huge experience gap in the corners and in the ring. So that's something that's interesting to me. Um, but one thing, I have one little bane of contention with something you said on this show here, Mike. One little uh, bane of contention. Bring it on, bring that, it that on. There is one champion, there is one champion, Tiafimo Lopez, and I actually do disagree. Because, because, unfortunately, when you say go to BoxRec and see how people got their titles and stuff, Tiafimo doesn't have a WBC title on BoxRec. That's one bane of contention. On Boxrec, he doesn't have any WBC title. Boxrec aren't recognizing the franchise title. And neither is the WBO, WBA, and the IBF. Because if you go to their rankings, they always have the other champions from the other sanctioning bodies listed. And just like with the WBC's rankings, they don't have the WBA regular champion recognized. They've got the WBA super. The WBA have Devin Haney recognized as the WBC champ. The IBF do. And so do the WBO, which means the three sanctioning bodies and their titles are not unified with the WBC, according to their own official released rankings, which means the titles aren't all unified. Whether a guy is a paper champion or not, not all champions are created e equally. He picked the WBC title up out of the trash before, right? <laughs> He's still a world champion. But, okay, but that's if you are buying into the sanctioning organization nonsense. By the way, I didn't know that the uh, that box rec didn't recognize the franchise, so big ups on that because I didn't know that. Um, I know at Ring, we don't recognize the WBA regular. We've been, That's a new thing where we're like, you know what, screw it. We're, we're trying to figure out which we should recognize, which we should not recognize. But my question to you, Mark, is I understand the sanctioning bodies have their rules and they change them as they go. I mean, literally, they change this shit 
all the time, right? It's difficult to keep up with. Mm -hmm. You know who the division, or who the man in the division is, right? Who did Tiafima Lopez beat versus who did Devin I, Haney beat? I know who the lean, lean is. That, that's, Look, that, but that's all that right. matters. I get that. that. That's all that matters. Do you, no, no, do you no, really, really feel, do you really really feel that Tiafima Lopez has to beat Devin Haney to prove himself as the, as the guy? No, I don't. But okay. he goes to become the undisputed champion factually. The factual undisputed champion. Until the WBC because or the he, WBA changes another rule, he might be the undisputed champion for three weeks, and then they change another rule, and they add another title. So what are we going to do then? Strip him of his undisputed... Listen, man, if the WBC hadn't elevated Lomachenko, they really fucked everything up. Because when they elevated Lomachenko the franchise, that screwed everything up. If they wouldn't have done that, and Tiafima Lopez had beat Lomachenko the way he did, this wouldn't even be a question. That's the way I tend to look at it. Screw the sanctioning bodies. They're but then there's the problem. Isn't that the problem, though? They screwed it up. This wouldn't be a question, but it is. And the term undisputed means no dispute. And there is a legitimate dispute. Because the WBC created something, called this title undisputed, and it's not been confirmed by the other three sanctioning bodies. And in their own rankings, they disagree with the premise. And okay, if we're so going to talk about this. the idea, let, just... Let oh, no, wait, wait, wait. Okay, okay, you go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Let me get it. If we're going to follow, if we're going to follow sanctioning bodies bullshit, we got to go with a majority at the very least. And Mauricio Solomon's in the minority here. If we're not, if we're just going to just pull a discrepancy and say, fuck all of them, <laughs> fuck all of them, then no title matters at all. None of them do. You can't recognize him as a three-belt unified champion by them and then not recognize who they recognize as the other champion in the division, because that's a direct contradiction. But if you go with Mauricio Solomon, you're buying into him also doing the same thing by changing the rules. And with the franchise, he's done it three times. So the franchise can't just be instantly recognized because he says so, but then the other champions are recognized because they say so, but then who they recognize as the other champion still isn't, but what he says goes. That's not fair. They decide who their titles are uniform with. Not him. I hear what you're saying, but for me, I recognize <laughs> I recognize the ring champion. I recognize the lineal legitimate champion. That's the way I've always done it. I mention BCBA with most of the time in jest just to make fun of these assholes. You know that, Mark. I, and I just look, I do mm -hmm. I do I want to see Tiafima Lopez fight Devin Haney? Yes. But personally, I think Ryan Garcia is a much bigger challenge to him right now than Devin Haney. Um, I, I think Garcia has proven more at 135 against legitimate 135 pounders with the win over Campbell than Haney has. So I think we're getting caught up on semantics. I won't, I won't use the word undisputed. That's fine. I won't use that word. But I'll call Tiafima Lopez the legitimate lineal champion of the division and everybody else is a title holder can we agree on that i completely agree because i'm calling cool. him the unified lineal champ that's my whole thing and cool. uh, my only bane of contention is when people <laughs> think he's the only champion the only champion he's the, uh, that's my whole problem well uh, i don't call the other be. guys champions i call be. them title holders that's fair that is that is very fair but Tio is the lineal champion. Now, now, let's say... Uh, we just found common question, ground. Right? Do you see how Mark, me and Mark just found common ground? If we could all do it this way in boxing, we'd be in a much better place. But everybody beefs over this the semantics bullshit. But see, me and Mark, we made our points, <clears throat> and we found middle ground. Anyway, I'm sorry, Mark. Go ahead. Continue to the next one. Yeah, the next one is uh, the pound for pound topic. There has to, I know that there's going to be some consideration on the pound for pound list you know, with the Ring Magazine pound for pound list and the pound and such. And Kazuto Iyoka, he's pushed himself into a position to finally get into a pound for pound. And I just want this to be heard to some extent by any panel members. If, if you were just going to sit there and say, and he hasn't quite done enough. Remember you elected Errol Spence into the pound-for-pound -pound list a bull wrong beside who was coming off of a win over Chuck Tico. Okay, remember this. When Errol had 
just beaten Kell Brook. Yes. Just um, remember that. I, I hear you. I hear and for, and for the record, Mark, this man, th- th- our, our ratings process is democratic. democratic. And there's people from around the world that vote. Um, people think it's an all-American panel. That's not true at all. We have voters from uh, Asia, Europe, Latin America, uh, all over the place. And um, when we put Errol on there as high as we put him, like I wasn't really with that. When we originally, when everybody bumped Canelo to number one pound for pound, I wasn't with that. I didn't think he had done enough yet, enough yet to be number one. When Golovkin was number one pound for pound, uh, I, I didn't agree with that at the time uh, when he originally was number one. I, I think sometimes a lot of people jump the gun. But I'm with you. Ioka has clearly done more in a pound for pound sense than other guys on the list right now. But you know, guys in the, in the lower divisions just don't get the love, man. <clears throat> I, I know they don't, but I'm kind of putting forward a plea to something that's supposed to be called the Bible of boxing. All right? It's supposed to be called the Bible of boxing. If it's truly the Bible of boxing, and this is. This is meant to be the, this is the pound for pound list. You say yourself, any list without Kazuto Ioka on it right now is incomplete. You said that yourself with your own child. Yes. And the people who will be there, if you're excluding a man who's 17 and 2 in title wins, a former unified champion, a man coming off of another guy who was deemed to be on the bubble three weight world championship, right? In his only two losses, 75% of all fans scorecards, according to Eye on the Ring, fight score, etc. He fights against Donnie Nietes and against I'm Not Run Wrong, who in his prime was an extremely capable fighter. Yes. And so is Donnie Nietes. Both of Donnie Nietes, formerly on the Ring Magazine, pound for pound list, he needs to be given some type of credence. Me personally, I have him rated quite high. I have him in my top six pound for pound, and I believe he's earned that spot. I've seen four weight world champions like Chuck Letito go to number one with similar statistics himself, less less defeats, obviously, and one or two more champions total defeated. But that's why he was number one, and the Oka would be number five. But in comparison to 90% of that list, Kazuto Ioka is the third the third most proven champion who would be on the list in terms of title fights, accolades, and top 10 level opposition for according according to the Ring Magazine's ratings, specifically, not according to sanctioning bodies, so top 10 opponents fought in weight divisions, true those four, former world champion, Akira Yagashi, Juan Carlos Rebecco, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and three-way champion, Kosoi Tanaka, who in every division he was in, was rated inside the top three according to Ring Magazine. That's my plea to anybody who's on the path. That is my plea. If you're going to include people who've had one world title fight and pushed them right into the top eight pound for pound, you can at least push a guy who's proven way more against way more level of opposition, against more champions, including pound for pound caliber talent as well, when he was coming up in weight in two of those types of fights. That's all I'll say. Well said, my man. Well said. And uh, believe me, I made the push this weekend on our panel. And I can't say anything, but the ratings will be out soon. And I think you'll be happy. <clears throat> I hope so. I hope so. I, I, I really do. Because he, he finally deserves it. He's, to me, like I'm actually not like a big fan of him. I just hate the idea of fighters not getting credit where credit is due. And I feel he's been one of the most disrespected fighters on the planet for the last three years in terms of like worldwide acclaim or anything because he's a beautiful fighter to watch. He's an aggressive defensive fighter. He's mm-hmm. extremely calm. He's got beautiful angles. He's a mm-hmm. body technician. His defense, not just weaving and ducking or whatever and setting traps. You said this yourself, and it's a very sort of thing. He's a beautiful carrier. Yes, And if it's just like half locked shots or whatever, he's taking the sting off of it. And that's why he was able to beat Tanaka. It was because, well, Tanaka was getting 60% of his damage out. Ioka was getting 100% of his damage out because he was blocking 40 to 50% of Tanaka's work. 
He was just blocking it or partial blocking it. So taking the sting off and dishing the same amount at full velocity, and that's what won the fight. Agreed. Pretty much. It was just poor dissection. So, and you don't see that, by the way. When people talk about slick fighters and stuff, that's one of the slickest fighters in the world right there. Well, He's very slick. Very you composed. hit on something, though. But he doesn't look yeah. slick in the sense of, of how Western, and I talked about this on my channel, uh, Western, particularly American boxing fans, are used to seeing, when they think slick, they think shoulder roll, they think Sweet Pea, they think Floyd. It, there's a subtle beauty to what Ioka does and other fighters from that part of the world. Uh, I mentioned this to uh, some of the Eastern European fighters, some of the Latin American fighters, where it's parrying, it's punching with the guy, it's moving a guy where you want him. Um, sometimes it's a shift back, the half step back. There's little things you could do where maybe you're not you know, slipping and sliding and making the guy miss 100%. But as you said, you're taking off 40%. And you do that round after round after round. You start wearing a dude down, especially when you're coming back at 100% with superior angles uh, and, and leverage on your punches. And that's what some of these guys have perfected from other parts of the world. And I think just a lot of American fight fans, and unfortunately some credentialed media here, I'll admit it, just don't recognize that as a form of skillful, I'm going to use another term, athletic defense. It's, I think, an ethnocentric thing. Um, and, you know, I, I could get into a whole political debate, Mark, but I got some other calls here. Uh, outstanding freaking points. I agree with everything you said. And believe me, I'm making the push, brother. I'm making the push. All right. Thanks for having me on, Mike. All right, man. We'll do it again. Have a good one. All right, we got a couple more calls here, guys. Um, Mark always has great stuff, and he uh, loves watching the little guys. And he's very, very nuanced in his opinion and, and his viewpoints. So I love when Mark calls in, man. And Mark does really good stuff on his channel, too. Let me jump to another quick call here. 4477, you're on the show. Go. How you doing, Michael? It's uh, Nigel. You right? Nigel, what's up, man? It's been a while since you called in. I'm good, in. thank you, man. Yes, man, dad life and lockdown life in England. Uh, man. It's been... I hear you. Yeah, it's been a bit rough, man, a bit of a bit rough. But um, what I wanted to... <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Um, I wanted to um, touch on a few things, like with regard to the last call of Mark. Extremely knowledgeable. And with regard to Ioka, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what he said wholeheartedly that man does deserve to be on the pound for pound list without a shadow of a doubt it was a masterful performance that he put on truly truly great and it is very annoying how the little guys are not appreciated or get the fans for that they truly truly deserve because you have some magnificent fighters you know mm -hmm. really really do i mean you got guys um like you had a gentleman from uh, asian boxing on a few months ago he's uh, great too. last year i believe it was Yes. yes, and um, he always he's he always shines a light on these little guys and puts the fights on and stuff like that, you know. And you know, links for the fights, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, I think Ioka did for for I've been watching him for a while now, and he is a fantastic fighter. He really, really is, he really is. Um, but one thing I wanted to pick your brain about. Um, there was a tweet from a gentleman, uh, Taylor O'Higgins. I sh maybe I shouldn't have named him, but I thought it you know quite prudent. Um, he mentioned something about um, the standard of coaching of uh, fighters from the UK against, say, like the top level elite fighters. So, what I mean is, um, with regard to Callum Smith against Canelo and uh, Luke against uh, Ryan Garcia at the weekend, it was hard to see the. You know, there, was, there, was, there wasn't like no adjustments being made at all or anything different that the corner seemed to be telling them. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Um, yeah, and 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 um, I think I mean, but the Joe Gallagher. I mean, Joe Gallagher fighters tend to do the same thing. I mean, Anthony Crawler was a Joe Gallagher fighter. Do you know what I mean? And uh, um, and and it just seems like you know, high guard doing fundamentally sound, but right. But I think at the elite level, you need. Yeah, disciplined, you know, model professional, that shell of a doubt, but you need that something, do you know what I mean, to take you to the edge and mix it at, at that level, you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? Cause, yeah, um, absolutely. 
Yeah, because you're, you're not the only one. Yeah, that's... I'm... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Let's go ahead. Yeah, because um, because I looked at Callum Smith and against Canelo, and I'm like, dude, just jab him to fucking death. Jesus Christ, you're over six foot. You know what I mean? It's right. Like, yeah. <laughs> stay in the center because yeah, when you're doing it, you stay in the center of the ring. It's not going to be pretty. You know what I mean? But you know, just keep. You know, obviously, um, Canelo has like got a cheat code for boxing now. It's pretty fucking obvious now, isn't it? You know. Fantastic. But anyway, <laughs> and it's like, you know, and then eventually you see him being walked, you know, being backed up to the ropes and stuff. And I'm like, right. what are you doing? Right. What, he should have been what, the center of the ring, turning thing. Canelo, turning him, turning him, turning, leaning on him, uh, pulling some of the Vladimir Klitschko and Lennox Lewis, you know, that kind of school. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And none of, and I didn't see any of that. I was quite, well, I don't know whether or not it was the weight playing the part with regards to Callum Smith because he's, he's fucking huge for super middle. How he makes super middle, I don't know. Yeah. I really, really don't. He's huge. He really is, yeah. But he just seems to just run out of ideas very, very quickly. And um, and and, and then um, uh, well, Luke Campbell's case, um, I mean, Shane McGuigan a, is a great coach. He really is. He's a fantastic coach. But yes. again, just seem, seem to like run out of ideas, it seems. You know? And yeah, so, what's, so what, would, what did you, what observations, what to ask? If you well, to specifically with Joe Gallagher, I, I mean, you're not the first person to bring up, um, it, there just seems to be a model with his fighters. They all look the exact same. Yeah. And then, so, so with, mm. with Callum Smith, I, I mean, I think that was a, another calculated, opportunistic matchmaking endeavor from Team Canelo, Team Reynoso. They knew exactly what they were doing when they fought Callum oh, Smith. Yeah. Did. He was rated number one at the yeah. time. Nobody in their right mind believes Callum Smith is the best super middleweight in the world, but because he got away with one against John Ryder, he fought in a pretty weak super middleweight tournament. I give him credit for going through the World Boxing Super Series, but that super middleweight tournament, when he won, it was probably the weakest tournament they've had, to be fair. Uh, so. Mm. Yeah, I, you know, and it's the same thing when Canelo plucked Sergey Kovalev when he did. He's basically doing what Floyd Mayweather did, what Oscar De La Hoya did. I, although Oscar did fight a lot of badasses, but a lot of the big names in boxing have oh. done that for years. Um, with yeah. uh, with Luke Campbell against um, against Ryan Garcia, that was another calculated matchmaking. Where look, everyone oh. knows Luke Campbell is a very good, technically sound fighter. But it's one punch at a time. Yeah. It's on the back foot. He doesn't punch in combination. Uh, everything's pretty much oh. coming straight at you. You're not going to get 45s. He's not going to bounce around you. He's not going to turn you. It's going to be straight shots oh. with him on the back foot. And that played right into oh. what King Rai wanted to do. Uh, he also, if, yeah. I don't know if you know this, but um, Luke keeps his hands high. You know, his, his hands were here. Yeah. And it's the more and more tired he got, the elbows flared out. And I saw it, and yes, it, it, it took did, a while did, for yeah. Garcia to see it. it now, Canelo would have saw mm. that in three seconds, but it took Ryan a round or two because for like the, the fifth and sixth round, mm. like, go to the body. What are you doing? But he finally got it. He fainted yeah. upstairs, came downstairs, boom, that was it. And that shot was there for yeah. several rounds, right? So, um, yeah. And, you know, and to, um, Vasily Lomachenko saw that. Other guys saw that. They just they didn't have the length and, and height and explosiveness that Garcia had. So I don't want to beat up on mm. trainers. I don't want to beat up on um, British Me fighters. Neither. No, no, no. Yeah. There's a ton of British. Yeah. There, there's some outstanding British fighters that have made adjustments. Anthony Joshua has shown that he can make adjustments in the fight. He has shown that he can fight mm. on the outside yeah. and the inside. Uh, he fought backing up mm. at times against Parker, against um, against Ruiz in their rematch. So there are fighters who can make mm. adjustments. Sometimes you're just working with a limited fighter, and sometimes you're working with a li limited trainer. And I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. And but but by me saying what I say though, with regards to uh, Shane McGuigan and uh, Joe Gallagher, by no means am I going to um, you know um, dismiss their accomplishments. They are right. you know fantastic servants of the sport and. And as a Brit, you know, long may they continue. You know what I mean? Because right. they bring up, they do train some very, very good fighters. But I just feel that something is missing, and I just, I just, I just see it. You know what I mean? And um, it's just like, well, what else can we do? Is it the fact that uh, fighters are sucking down too much weight to make weights? And should they, should they, should they move up sooner or something? Do you know what I mean? I think I don't it's, know. I don't know. It's for for me. 
what I see a lack of <clears throat> with a lot of those guys is angles. Um, it, it, it's a lot of one twos. Um, you know, I, it, Smith does have a nice catch counter left hook, but you can get yeah. under it and you can get around it. And one thing he doesn't do well with it is I, it's hard for me. I'm sitting down, so I can't really show, but if, 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 if I'm standing directly in front of you and I throw a left hook, I got to really cork it. But if I get over to your side, mm. then I don't need to cork it. And it's a little faster. And guys like Canelo have perfected that. We, we've seen that from Ioka. Um, Ryan Garcia is actually pretty good at it. You can actually shoot it wide because you're punching with your waist when you, when you get proper position. Mm. And if you're on the back foot and you're squared up, you're not going to get the same position. So even Smith with that catch counter hook, that works against a certain level of fighter, but it was missing against yeah. Canelo because Canelo saw it from a mile away because he wasn't in proper position. Mm. So I think something some of these British fighters and trainers can work on is um, it's just better angles, uh, working in circles as opposed to straight in and out, and not always being on the mm. back foot. Sometimes you got to put. Look at Tyson Fury once he made a change in camp. And got with Sugar Hill Stewart. Yeah. Look at him now. Uh -huh. Holy shit, is he a different fighter? Right? So there is Very just a style so. yeah, over definitely. here yeah. that I think some of those British trainers, British fighters need to come over here and start working with some of the old school American trainers and just adopting some of the different things. The just little nuances over here. And they will. I think I think it's coming. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And also touching on about what you mentioned about Canelo. You, in Ryan Garcia's performance, I mean, showed a hell of a lot of composure getting up from that monster left that he took from uh, yes. uh, Campbell. He really, really did. I was, yeah, but you can see the influence of Canelo in his performance a little bit in his in I mean in his footwork and like in his um you know when he's trying to set traps and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? And yes. even that hook when he caught uh, Campbell to the body, where like you think he's got. I mean, I mean, Canelo did that against Golovkin in, in both fights. You know what I mean? It's like. Okay, you think he's shooting it up top, but he's just getting you right. You know what I mean? It's beautiful. Yes. It really was. Peach of a shot. Peach of a shot. It's so subtle. It's so very, very subtle. It really, what a lot, a lot of people think when you faint, you have to faint with your upper body. You don't have to. Yeah. If I'm, if I'm doing a jab, jab on you, boom, 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 and I'm stepping in every time. Uh, Kodo did this very well, where you step with, you could set up a feint where you step with the first jab and then just step forward and then just shoot a hook. And you think, because uh. you see my foot move that second time, you think the jab's coming and it's the same rhythm. But I ain't doing anything different uh. with my upper body. I'm shooting a hook. So sometimes I think guys think they have to feint by doing all this shoulder shit and, you know, sticking their hands. Sometimes you can feint just with your feet. And that's something Canelo does really mm. well because he's not the fastest guy with his feet, but he moves. No, he's not. No, but he moves in proper position, and he feints you with mm. with his step, his side step, a forward step, a backward step, and you think a certain punch is coming because he's punched with that same rhythm with his feet, and he just changes the angle with his upper body. It's really pretty stuff, man. It's a different yeah. way of doing it. Yes, definitely, definitely is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way, one more thing, and I'll shoot off. I'm sure I got other calls, right? Okay. Now, obviously, we mentioned about our prospects and things like that. Um, Boots, Ennis, Virgil Ortiz, and um, but one that's flown under the radar. Well, I talked about someone on Twitter. That fucking cesspool that is Twitter. I love it. <laughs> I love it. It's it's dirty, but you need to shout oh, yeah, 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 anyway. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Xander Sayas. Oh yeah. Very. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and like um. It's, I've seen some of his performances on YouTube and fights and whatnot. He looks very, very good. What are your opinions on that young man? Because I see, I see something special there. I like everything. <clears throat> man, I went out and jogged earlier. I breathed in a lot of cold air in my throat. <clears> throat> he, I like what I see. More beer, more beer. That's what I know, right? Yeah, beer. yeah, I need yeah. to have a beer tonight. He um, does everything nice, but I just want to see him step up the opposition a little bit. I want to see him do it against yeah. a slightly better level of opposition before I get too excited. But he's a few fights in, mm. and it looks like he could do all the punches. He's got every punch in the book. Uh, I, I like the angles. Everything looks nice and tight. I just want to see him step up the opposition mm. a little bit in 2021 before I get too excited. Okay, yeah. Fair enough. Fair dues, man. Fair dues. 
Right. Well, Mike, I'm going to shoot off and let you answer some calls. And always a pleasure. You keep up the good work, man. Appreciate everything that you do. And uh, and we will speak again in the future. Um, All right. Thank yeah. you, sir. Have a good one. Take care, bro. You too. Take care, mate. Bye. Good stuff from Nigel. And Nigel actually hit on something, um, uh, a tweet that I saw from my man, Mark Butcher. Um, Butcher Bad. Uh, Mark Butcher is an awesome guy. Uh, been a boxing writer for a long, long time. He He's who brought me into Boxing Monthly years ago. So um, he's one of those guys I've, I've always looked up to. Great guy. He tweeted something to the effect, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, um, a lot of our British fighters that have been going over and fighting against elite level uh, competition overseas have not done as well recently. So some changes need to be made. Kind of what Nigel was alluding to there. So, so it's something that I think more and more, the, the thing with the UK fans, some of the UK fans are fanatical, but you know, fan is short for fanatic, but I can say that about every fan base, right? But I, I would say right up there with the Mexican fans, the UK fans are very, very knowledgeable and they know what they're seeing. And so there's right now in, in UK British boxing, uh, you're seeing a struggle at the top level right now when these, when these guys are stepping up and they're fighting elite level opposition overseas. There's a few guys that are still doing great. Again, I mentioned Anthony Joshua. He's right up there with Tyson Fury. Those guys, they're, they're UK guys. So um, they're doing great. But We've seen it in several recent fights. I could point to in 2020, there was multiple cases of this where uh, some, some British fighters really struggled when they left the comforts of their backyard or when they really stepped up to the elite level uh, of opposition. So there do need to be some changes and some, and some tweaks. And this is how it goes in boxing. There's ebbs and flows. But obviously, UK boxing is red hot. It is a hot spot in the world of boxing. And that is going to continue. Uh, I think again, uh, match room, Eddie Hearn specifically, um, there's all the other promoters, but Eddie Hearn and match room, they have really built something over there. There's a real product with what they're doing over there in the UK. All right. A couple more calls guys. And then I'll get back to the review. I promise. Let's jump back to the phones here. Uh, 901. You're on TNC. Go. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mike, thanks for having me on. Uh, this is Ceylon. It's been a while. Ceylon, um, what's up, man? I was, uh, well, man, I'm trying to see if my bud Mario called in last couple of times. Uh, you, you, you definitely notice him. He's not very forgettable. I missed your past couple of shows. My bud Mario call in. I don't know if he's calling. I've, you know what? The last couple of weeks, I haven't had many calls because there just hasn't been a. It's the end of the year. Uh -huh. and there just hasn't been that much, you know, to talk about because a lot of the fights have been mismatches. So I don't know if he's called in in a while. Okay, gotcha. Well, I was just uh, back home in Ocean County, New Jersey. We were together over the holidays. We had a uh, we had a watch party for uh, the Ioka Tanaka fight. Uh, okay, you know the show Jersey Shore. Of course, my sister watches that crap. <laughs> it's, it's painfully boring. Well, anyway, funny thing is, my house uh, is one mile north, and they even filmed the first episode at the gym I was going to at the time. Nice. Like, I just happened to walk in, and there was those goofballs, the guy with the mushroom-shaped haircut and everything. And um, <laughs> it's one, one mile north. Like, all of my cousins... Uh, well, not all of them, just like 30 of them or so. They all live in Seaside Park, which okay. is like 25 feet from where they Yeah, that's it. like right there. Yeah, that's uh, Juicehead Central, oh, Guido Central. Yeah, right yeah. there. Oh, yeah, dude. I grew up with the people that those guys are pretending to be like. Exactly. Uh, anyway, like, so, uh, yeah, my buddy, my buddy Midwest Ceylon, he came up there for a watch party. And uh, the dude started pre-gaming, like, at the normal time with his old style. And he passed out when the opening bell rang for Tanaka. So, uh, the next Well, it was, day, like, 4 a.m. I mean, the... shit. Yeah, yeah. But, it, come on. I mean, the guy's supposedly a boxing fanatic <laughs> of some type. But, like, uh, I don't know. So, we anyway, so... When he came to and sort of straightened himself out, we uh, we took him to a, a meeting, you know, one of those meetings that's for anonymous people. And uh, it's like, I don't know what to do with the guy. The whole, the whole drinking thing and not being allowed in the neighborhood bars anymore, 
it, it stops <laughs> being funny when you spend 14 hours a day in front of the TV watching softball and women's field hockey. <laughs> so, it, it, you know, it, that's, that's a little weird, man. Uh, so, uh, I, I don't know. That was a line straight so anyway, from Midwest Sea Law. That was a line straight from him. Oh, man. <clears throat> You know, I don't get it. So what happened? What happened with the uh, I heard Shakur Stevenson and Andre Ward split, and, and what's next for Shakur Stevenson anyway? I I haven't heard anything, and uh, I I don't know what's next for him. And is 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 Tank Davis going to fight? Uh, who is it? Um, Abner Mares or Gary Russell Jr. next? And I don't know. Shakur Stevenson. What do you got? At some point, Stevenson is in line to face the winner between Jamel Herring and Carl Frampton. So I don't think he's going to sit and just wait okay. for the winner, but he'll fight a filler fight in between. But that's the fight he wants. That's his coming out party, if you will, especially if Herring beats Frampton, because that's going to be really easy to market on ESPN, a passing of the torch kind of thing. So that's what he's going to be doing this year. And it wouldn't surprise me if, say, he gets herring this summer and maybe defends that title once and then maybe goes up to 35 in the next 12 months uh for davis yeah it's pretty much going to be sadly i could see a fight with gary russell jr and that'd be like a battle of the beltways like the baltimore beltway versus the dc beltway and they could do that at the uh yeah. that casino there in dc now that they got uh I, one of, there's an mgm there uh in the suburbs of dc where they could do that and that unfortunately, that'd probably be pay per view, man. And then if he fights someone like Abner Mares, I know it sounds crazy. I don't want to see that shit, but that would probably be it at Los Angeles, where you, you could do a crowd there. Uh, I really hope Tank steps up and starts fighting people, but they have a business plan over there with him, man, and they're they're going to go that route for a while, unfortunately. Yeah, it seems that it seems that Tank Tank does have have name recognition among the general population of the U.S. Like uh, that's the that's he's the only up and comer I've heard in years. Anybody I've just run into at the gym and talked about this stuff bring up. Um, but it seems like he's not relevant. To, he's he's quite relevant to the sport of boxing, but he's not relevant to any weight class. Yeah, I mean, right now, <clears throat> at the beginning of the show, I talked about the WBA situation. He has a piece of one other titles at 135, a piece of one other titles at 130. At ring, we rate him at 130 because, according to his team, that is the, the division he is campaigning in right now. So we get shit from Tank fans. They're like, why don't you rate him at 135? Because he's fighting at 130. Uh, and then for a while, when he, he did one fight at 135 but missed weight, we didn't know where to rate him, so we didn't have him rated for a while because we didn't know what division he was going to be in. So <clears throat> he's kind of all over the place, but if he stays at 130, as long as he fights Miguel Burchell, I'm cool with that. Miguel Burchell is the number one guy in the division. Tank is number two. Those two need to fight in 2021. They need to fight this year, and if they want to – I don't think that's a pay-per-view worthy fight, but that's what they would do. They put that on pay-per-view. Cool. I'll support it because the winner of that fight's the legitimate – 130 champ but tank has the potential to cross over uh he's very very popular in the hip-hop community with with uh young fans on social media and stuff but he he hasn't crossed over or anything like that his his pay-per-view with santa cruz i, I think that did like a hundred thousand maybe two hundred thousand at most pay-per-view buys so he's not a crossover star by any means he needs to fight some names that get people interested to kind of get to that next step you know but his event in uh, in Atlanta against um, Gambo was huge. I mean, that was a big success. Yes, I was there, man. I was ringside for that. That was a sellout crowd. Um, that was a crazy rowdy crowd. Wow, I'm jealous. Um, yeah, that was fun. Uh, oh, there there cool. was a million rappers there that I didn't even know who the hell they were. But um, that was a lot of fun. And he look, he has done he's done crowds in uh, his 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 hometown of Baltimore. He's done crowds in. Atlanta and other markets. He has proven he can sell tickets. Now, it hasn't quite translated yet to like big TV ratings, 
or pay-per-view sales or anything like that with the broader casual audience, but he's definitely built a brand uh, with a lot of the same demographics Floyd Mayweather was extremely popular with. So uh, he's, he's, you know, they got something there. It's just, you know, I just want to see him step up, man. I just want to see him take it to the next level. And I hope he does sooner or later. One more question. Did, uh, did Shakur Stevenson and Andre Ward part ways? And yeah. uh, how's that going to affect your, st- huh? How's that going to affect Stevenson's career? You reckon, or no effect at all? Or I, honestly, man, I don't see no effect at all uh, at this point. Um, and I've heard that they've split ways. I mean, I haven't talked to Shakur or anything, but I've heard that they've split ways, and it was amicable, no, no issues or anything like that. But I think that there's just a different vision there with how they want to handle things. If you look at the way Andre Ward handled his career, it was satisfying for him and his family but it was very unsatisfying for boxing fans. So I personally look at that split as a good thing for Shakur. Um, Because I think, you know, again, if he fights the winner between Herring and Frampton this year and then makes a move up to, I mean, I'd love to see him at 130 against Burchelt or or Davis, but the politics will prevent that. But he could move up to 35 and fight some guys uh, top rank has guys at 26 that can move up and fight him. He's got options. He's got plenty of options. He'll be busy. Who is the guy that, uh, I forgot one more. Who is the guy that Joe Smith Jr. is going to fight for the WO, WBO? I know they uh, had that mini tournament. Uh, one of the Russians dropped out. I don't know that guy so well. How's that looking? And thanks. Uh, no problem, man. Uh, let's see. I want to see if they got that fight on Box Rick yet. <clears throat> Let me see. They got that fight listed yet? They do have a Maxim Vlasov. Yeah, um, they have that. Wow, that's in February. I didn't realize that fight was official yet. Um, Maxim Vlasov is a good quality fighter. He's fought at cruiserweight. He's fought it all the way down. I want to say he's fought a couple fights at middleweight. And um, who beat him? Uh, when he went up to cruiserweight, he lost to Christoph Glavaki. So he didn't wear a cruiserweight very well. But he's been back. I'm just looking here at uh, his box rack. He's been back at 175 for a year or so. He just beat Isaac Chalemba in 2019. A good quality fighter and is going to give a good fight, good technical fighter with a lot of experience. He'll give Joe Smith a good fight, but I favor Joe Smith big uh, to, to win that fight on the cards. So he'll be the next WBO champ, man. Cool beans. All right, brother. I got another call here. I'm going to jump to, man. Thanks for calling in. Thank you so much. All right, bro. Have a good one. All right, we'll jump to one more call here, guys, and then um, we'll finish up this review. We'll talk some Ryan Garcia, Luke Campbell real quick. Let me just jump to one more call. Uh, 773, you're on TNC. Go. What's up, Mike? I got to say... I called into a show recently and I said, English fighters are privileged and overrated. And they didn't like that. They didn't <laughs> like that. They said, oh, you look at all these fighters. Look at Anthony Joshua. Look at Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury is an Irish gypsy traveler. Anthony Joshua is Nigerian. They're not English, so to say. When I think of English fighters, I think of... Um, Josh Warrington, no true English. So I don't, people seem to get that confused. I know that's not politically, politically correct, but that's what I mean. And there's a reason why Canelo Evers went, went and handpicked Rocky Fields, handpicked Callum Smith coming off a bad performance. Um, the reason why Ryan Garcia has got a lot of hype behind him. They want to get a quote unquote credible win. So they went and fought Luke Campbell. I just think they got a lot of money behind them, a big fan base. The English, the English love their boxing, then football, soccer over here. So I just think they – would someone like from Romania get the same opportunity, someone like a Callum Smith or Luke Campbell did? I don't think so. I don't think they would be getting the title shots, getting in, put in the uh, Super Series, getting to fight George Groves and, and his last leg. All these things, I just don't think a lot of fighters all over the world would have the same luxury, the same opportunities, same privileges, and people don't like that. So, uh, what do you think about that? 
I mean, I understand what you're saying to a certain degree. Um, I would say that there are very good British fighters out there. I mean, I'm just, you mentioned Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua, and I understand that there's an English ethnicity, but there's also an English nationality. And I mean, you know, Lennox Lewis, uh, I consider him a, a British fighter, but yeah, Josh Warrington, Callum Smith. What about Josh Taylor, man? I mean, does Josh Taylor count? Um, I, I think uh, Billy Joe Saunders. He's Scottish. Is, he's, Scottish. I, I, he's not English, but it's part of the UK, no? It's part of the United Kingdom. I mean, Billy Joe Saunders, I'm uh, looking here. Uh, Kel Brook was a damn good fighter at his best. I think Joe Joyce is a, uh, a good fighter. Amir Khan, Carl Frampton. Uh, so... I, I get what you're saying, but there's a big scene in the UK and there's big promotional outfits over there, man. There's network support behind these fighters. So you mentioned a fighter from Romania or some, somewhere like that. Um, yeah, they would have to leave Romania and sign with a British promoter, a German promoter, an American promoter to get on because that, that's the power structure in the sport. It's like right now you see a lot of fighters from Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, over there, they're not staying there and fighting. They got to come to the United States and sign with promoters here. Some of them have gone to Germany and stuff like that, because that's where the opportunities are. You know, um, you know, yeah. I mean, Callum, look, man, Callum Smith and all those guys at 168. That's a weak division. That's just a weak division that's overrated by a lot of people. Uh, so, do I rate Canelo's win over Callum Smith as a an elite, you know, uh, all time great kind of win? No, I don't. It's a good win when you look at the size difference and everything else and the way Canelo won. But is it as if I think him going the distance with Gennady Golovkin and losing seven rounds to five on my card, that's more impressive than him beating Callum Smith. Some people will think that's disrespectful, but I just rate Gennady Golovkin so much higher that, you know, just having a draw with Gennady Golovkin is better than beating Callum Smith. So I get what you're saying, but I also think it's unfair to say that all British fighters are privileged and overrated. I don't think that's fair. Yeah, when I say England, I mean English fighters, not the UK. I know the UK, they got, I think Ireland's part of the UK. They got Scotland, uh, Welsh fighters, that's the UK. So it's a big conglomerate. When I say England, I mean England. Um, but yeah, I could see it. They're, they're, I'm not denying it. There are good fighters over there, but I'm just saying. They got a big fan base. They got a lot of money behind them. So they get the opportunities and they get the credibility. So that's why I just feel like them and Mexican fighters, they seem to always get the benefit of the doubt in the scorecards. They get post over Maris, Canelo Alvarez versus Triple G. It's just what it comes down to. You look at the money, follow the money, and it always comes back to the money. And these two groups, English fighters and Mexican fighters, they got the money behind them. So that's why I said it. I said there's overrated over there. They, people were saying Callum Smith, the number one super middleweight. And, well, who has he beat? He beat a washed up George Groves and a Dom Nadam. Like, that's just two big, big wins. And people were saying he's like the number one super middleweight and he's a top 10 pound for pound fighter. That's what I mean when you're talking about privilege. You talk about. Um, oh, you heard, so you heard somebody call Callum Smith a pound for pound fighter? Yeah, people were saying he's the number one super middleweight, and he's a pound for pound level fighter. That before, um, I've never heard the pound for pound part. That. I, I've heard, I've heard the look. He was rated number one at super middleweight because, like I said, that's a incredibly weak division, and he did go through the tournament. And at, at the time when he fought in that tournament, the way everything worked out, he won the lineal championship. So that's why he was rated number one. But I don't see much of a distinction between him, Saunders, Benavidez. I've talked about this in several shows. I mean, I think Plant, Benavidez, I think those guys would beat him. Uh, I think Benavidez would probably knock him out. Um, so, so I don't rate Smith as this elite-level fighter, but he was briefly rated number one in the division. Now, he got a gift against John Ryder, another U.K. fighter. But um, I, I just think that it was – opportunistic matchmaking from Canelo. Hey, man, let, let's go be the, the lineal champ at 168 by plucking this dude because this is easy. This is low-hanging fruit. That's just the business of boxing, man. We've seen that 
uh, with fighters of all nationalities. But, dude, I don't know one reputable boxing platform that rated Callum Smith as a pound-for-pound level fighter. That's a new one to me. Uh, maybe not pound for pound, but they they rated him as a legit, as a legit like superstar. As a legit, they, they talk about elite fighters in England. They say, oh, oh Tyson Dude, Fury, Anthony Joshua, Kevin Smith. If he was Smith. a superstar, they looked at all these. He, if he was a superstar, Canelo would have fought him over in yeah. the UK. He had to come over here because nobody over there would have gave a shit. I mean, I won't say nobody, but they could have. They did a bigger crowd and everything over here. Um, so it's not like Anthony Joshua. Like, if Deontay Wilder and Anthony Joshua fought, Deontay's got to pack up and go over to the UK because Anthony Joshua is a much bigger star than he is, right? But it's a complete opposite. Like, Callum Smith, I, I, I've never seen him regarded as this big superstar fighter. I get your point, though, bro. I really do. Sorry to cut you off, man. <clears throat> yeah, were they even allowed? Did they allow um, seating at that event? Canelo no, uh, versus Smith? Yeah, they had seating. It was like socially distanced seating or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so maybe if they were allowed to fill up the stadium, they probably would have had that in England. I would have guaranteed it. They allowed um to pack the stadiums. They would have had that Wembley or something that filled it up, no doubt. But it's not a superstar, but he's 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 a credible opponent. People respect the Kellen Smith. They respected him as a legit opponent. And he really hasn't done nothing. He really hasn't beat elite fighters. Um, his last opponent, John Ryder, you said he probably got a gift decision. Yeah. Um, being able to fight George Groves, who's on his last leg, washed up, obviously not near the same as he was. That's very, um, you should be grateful. Not a lot of people get those opportunities to fight old champions on their last leg to be able to get that name. And I just feel like when it comes to certain fighters, they get those opportunities. Other fighters don't. They got to go through the, they got to claw their way to the top and they still don't get the title shots. They still don't get the title eliminators. And I just feel like that's the way boxing is. It's about money. Tell them it's English. They got a lot of money in England. It's sport boxing. But and I'll say this, the bro. The matters. People don't want to talk about it. I hear what you're saying, but for the go record, ahead. Calvis, or I'm sorry, uh, Caleb Plant could have went in that tournament. Benavidez could have went in. Gilberto Ramirez could have went in. They all had offers. You know, they, they could have went in that tournament. Their management told them not to. So imagine if PBC let David Benavidez and Caleb Plant go in the World Boxing Super Series. I, I think they would have rolled through all of it, including Smith and been in the finals. But they didn't want to do it. Gilberto Ramirez could have went in, but top rank didn't want him to do it. So... You got to give Callum Smith credit for entering the tournament and winning it. He can only fight who was put in front of him. And as far as uh, certain fighters not getting the same opportunities, I hear you on that. But, dude, that's part of the sport of boxing. I mean, that goes back to the very, very beginning. And right now you're seeing the guys that get the shit end of the stick most of the time are the new kids on the block. The new kids on the block right now happen to be mostly, not all the time, but a lot of these guys coming over from Eastern Europe. They're outside of the elite, the establishment right now. And that's why you see, you know, Canelo getting a decision over Golovkin and things like that, right? But, I mean, dude, I talked about Rolando Romero, who's just a prospect. He, he's an American who got a decision over um, – uh, who did he fight? Uh, man, let me check real quick. He fought um, – uh, Jackson Marinez, who was a Dominican fighter, and he got a decision over him. That was an in-house PBC decision there. So it happens in, in every direction, bro. But again, I hear what you're saying. <clears throat> yeah, you hear what I'm saying. I don't mean to defend all the English fans out there, but I just got to call it like you see it sometimes. And that's just the way I see it. But I'll leave it to him. I'll take my call. All right, brother. Have a good one, man. All right, let's... Uh, no, you too. Speaking of UK fighters... Let's jump over to this fight card. Uh, let's see. Where are we at here? Oh, man. We're going all, almost an hour and a half tonight. So I'm going to jump on this real quick. I'm sorry you guys had to wait so long for, for the fight uh, review here from last Saturday, J January 2nd in Dallas, Texas. First fight card of 2021. And this, of course, was on the zone here in the United States. In the main event, Ryan Garcia, TKO7 win over Luke Campbell. Wins an interim. Or no, wait. This was the vacant 
interim WC lightweight title. Blech. Let's talk about the undercard real quick because the Alvarado brothers from Nicaragua are fighting. Uh, Roger Gutierrez pulled the upset special win over Rene Alvarado, takes his WBA regular 130-pound title. This was a rematch. These guys fought in 2017 at the Belasco Theater in Los Angeles. I was ringside for that one. Alvarado won by KO in the seventh round. Uh, in this fight, Alvarado was dropped twice in the second, once in the 12th, but he won the majority of the rounds. In fact, I think uh, all three judges, I think, gave him seven rounds, but it was the knockdowns that were the difference. In the 12th round, uh, Alvarado dropped again by Gutierrez, and that was the difference for Gutierrez. That's how he was able to pull out that win. I think we're going to get a rubber match between these two by the end of the year, and that will be entertaining. Uh, so it was Gutierrez who improved from their first fight in 2017. Can Rene Alvarado make adjustments in the third fight? We shall see. But his brother, these guys are twin brothers, but they fight a couple divisions apart, like 22 pounds apart. It's very strange. Felix Alvarado scores a TKO 10 win over DJ Creel, uh, defends his 108-pound title, his junior flyweight title, I talked about this last week in the preview. Uh, Alvarado won his title in the Philippines. First defense in Japan. His second defense was this fight in the USA. Again, he's from Nicaragua. He's been on a hell of a run. He's improved a lot as a fighter. His losses were to Kazuto Ioka back in 2013. And that's a better looking win for Ioka right now. And then he lost to Juan Carlos Revico in 2014. Those are his only losses. There's no shame. Uh, Revico, one of the top fighters in, the, in his division, and uh, Ioka, one of the top fighters in the world. By the way, Ioka beat Revico in 2015. Again, just look at that guy's resume. Pound fighter. So um, good win by Felix Alvarado. Okay, main event, Ryan Garcia, TKO 7 win over Luke Campbell. Garcia down in the second round from a looping left hand from Campbell, who's a southpaw. So imagine him being here, looping it over the top. Uh, Ryan Garcia was keeping his head, chin straight up, didn't have his hands up to block that hook, hit him right in the temple, boom, down he goes. Took it fairly well, popped right back up. That shows that he was in terrific condition, but also not just physically, but mentally. He really didn't look bothered from it. He was hurt. He was clearly hurt. But he got up and put it on uh, Campbell toward the end of that second round. And really, in my opinion, I thought, other than that second round, maybe you could give Campbell one other round. I thought Garcia did the better work in the majority of the rounds of this fight. And I told you guys in my preview last week that Campbell was going to have success early. All the experience he has and everything else. And his, his southpaw stance, his length, all of that, he knows how to use his length. But we would see some growing up on the job from Garcia. And that's what we saw in those middle rounds. And then he really started to put some heat on Campbell. And then he finally started to see some of the openings and made little adjustments, set up some punches, started to land some big shots. And if you look at both of these guys after the fight, in fact, a great show of sportsmanship. Uh, they were both together in the locker room. Uh, giving each other a hug, congratulating each other. I'm sure you guys have seen some of those videos on uh, social media. So awesome sportsmanship between these two. And both guys hurt each other. So when you see two guys hurt each other like that, regardless of who ends up winning, you generally see respect from the two fighters. So that was good to see. But, man, <clears throat> Luke Campbell's face was beat up. Ryan's looked pretty fresh. So all things considered, you could see the difference in power. And that's part of the matchmaking of this fight and why I favor Garcia to make a statement here. So um, I did notice, uh, again, I'm real quick with, with the body shot. Ryan Garcia throws a nice left hook, but he throws it up top a lot. He throws it wide, but it, it's really nice the way he throws it because like Canelo, he sets it up with a foot feint, a step feint. Instead of feinting uh, with his hands necessarily, it's with a step. So it's a rhythm thing. And if you can get a guy to think that a punch is coming downstairs to your body, if you keep stabbing him to the body, and he, he you know, is a, let's say you jab up top to the body, up top to the body, and you keep doing that, and you get a guy thinking that's the pattern. So it's boom, 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 right? And then all of a sudden, on that second one, instead of shooting down low, you wing a, a left hook. That's what Garcia does a lot. 
And I think he knocked out Romero Duno like that. There's a couple guys he's knocked out like that. And Canelo does it beautifully. He tried to do this against Campbell. Campbell saw it because Campbell is crafty and experienced. And he saw that coming and he got those, those hands up, especially from the southpaw stance, right? He was able to kind of uh, crunch the distance and, and get that hand up to, to uh, nullify that punch. But once King Rise saw, dude, that elbow is way up. I'm going to step in and come with that hook low. Even if I dip down and shoot it low, uh, I, I could hurt this guy. And he did that, and it was a beautiful liver shot. I've, I've seen some people suggesting that uh, Campbell quit. He didn't want to fight on. That is absolute bullshit. Campbell has been knocked down by Linares, Lomachenko, other, other fighters. He's always gotten up and fought on. And in fact, he against Linares, he got up and he may have beat Jorge Linares in, in Los Angeles. I was at that fight. It was really, really close. So he had moments after being dropped and won multiple rounds. That dude has heart and he's a tough guy. He could not get up. That was a paralyzing liver shot from Garcia. Beautifully set up and executed flawlessly. So he deserves credit. It took him a few rounds to see it. It would have taken Canelo a few seconds. That's the difference. That comes with experience. That's what the Reynosos will fine-tune and work on with Ryan Garcia going forward. But I saw a lot of hate against Ryan Garcia on social media after this fight. I didn't quite understand that. He is pretty. He is braggadocious. He is cocky. So he's going to get some hate. I get it. But for this particular fight, kick got up off the deck and closed the show. What is there to criticize? It doesn't mean he didn't make mistakes. It doesn't mean that there ain't things he needs to work on. The kid's 22. This was his first time stepping up. And that's why I go all the way back, full circle, to the beginning of the show, my opening rant about the difference between a prospect, a contender, a title holder, a champion. What we saw, I don't give a shit what the WBC tells you, the Zone's commentary crew, Golden Boy Promotions executives, I don't give a shit what any of them tell you. What we saw Saturday was Ryan Garcia move from prospect to contender. That's it. He's still at the other two levels. Prospect to contender, he's got two more levels to go. And by the way, we could say prospect, Contender, title holder, champion, superstar. So maybe there's five levels. He's on the second one, all right? So slow down. He's going to make mistakes. They do need to iron some things out. Yes, he was flat-footed against Campbell. I think that's because he didn't respect Campbell's power and he wanted to push him backward. You can't push somebody backward being on your toes. Look at Tyson Fury's footwork against Deontay Wilder in their two fights. In the first fight, he's up on his toes, moving around. The second fight, he was pretty flat-footed and coming straight forward. When you want to push your man back and plant some, some muscle into your punches, you're going to be a little more flat-footed. Flat-footed doesn't mean bad. And that's another thing that a lot of American fight fans, they're used to seeing a certain style of boxing from the 80s and 90s, Muhammad Ali footage, and you see guys bop, bouncing around and bobbing and weaving, and you think you got to fight like that to be skillful and athletic. Dude, you could be here and coming forward, feet planted, and use craft and, and, and talent and athleticism. You could just do it in a different way. So people need to open their minds up a little bit to different styles. That being said, Ryan Garcia needs to keep the chin down. He needs to move his damn head. He also needs to move at the waist more. He moves at the waist beautifully when he shoots hooks and right hands. There's a little bit of torque in his, in his waist, in his hips, but he doesn't do it defensively. He could benefit from a lean back and, and moving his head side to side and things like that. And those are the things that the Reynosos will start to iron out with him. But all things considered, this was passing a test and passing the test with an A. I can't give him an A plus because he got dropped. But in one sense, getting dropped and getting up is something a fighter needs to like live through and experience. And I think that's why he was so excited that he won his fight the way he won it because he had been put down. He did face adversity. Those things are going to happen as you move up the ladder. There are only so many fighters out there that will go an entire career without really being hurt badly or dropped or hit very cleanly. They're very, very rare. Everyone's going to get tagged. Even Floyd Mayweather, the, the, 
the GOAT in the eyes of so many fight fans on boxing Twitter. Dude, he got clocked by Judah. He got clocked by Henry Brucellis earlier in his career. He got clocked by Sh Shane Mosley, an old Shane Mosley. All right, there are guys who put some leather on Floyd here and there. Guess what? It didn't fucking matter. He came back and won those fights. So everyone relax. This kid's 22, okay? He will learn. This was a very good performance, and it's a good thing that he brings excitement to the sport. He's not sitting there talking shit, saying, I'm the champ and everyone's got to come through me. Meanwhile, he's got a title he won through email. He's calling out, dude, he called out Gervonta Davis, and he didn't do it on Twitter. He didn't do it through a manager. He did it seconds after knocking out Luke Campbell, okay? Give the kid a little credit. Stop hating so damn much and stop expecting so much from a 22-year-old who just became a contender. All right, rant over. We're going to close it out, guys. Again, reminder, probably won't have a show for a couple weeks because there's just not a whole lot to talk about. But over on my channel, we might do a couple of random live boxing chats, so look out for that. All right, guys. Uh, great show today. Great calls. Good stuff. I'll see you. <laughs> I can't even talk. I'll see you at the fights.